E with uh, Lacey Ford. My name is Maria. I'm the executive director of the Gatehouse. Thank you all for being here. Super excited this year, our Transforming Trauma Conference. It's our 10th year. We've had some really great sessions thus far today. This is our fourth session today. Um, take a look if you haven't checked out our website yet, thegatehouse.org, and click on Transforming Trauma Conference right on the banner. There are more sessions being hosted this week. Um, if It's on our Facebook page. So if you click on uh, Facebook and you do a search real quick and you type in the Gatehouse, you should be able to find our page there. Otherwise, we do have a YouTube channel as well. If you type in Gatehouse Toronto and search on YouTube, you should be able to find the Gatehouse YouTube channel and click on the live and it should be there as well. So you can definitely share those across your social media platforms. They're all um, open videos. They're not uh, password protected or anything. So you should be able to see if uh, you have to leave the session. Um, you can definitely check it out later on social media because it is being broadcast live as we speak. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lacey Ford, our art therapist, who's going to introduce herself and talk a little bit about her organization, Full Circle Art Therapy Center. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maria. So I'm going to actually just open up a slideshow I prepared um, as I'm speaking. I think it should show my face at the same time, uh, if I recall correctly. So just bear with me a moment. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so as Maria was mentioning, my name is Lacey Ford. So uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, yeah, so I'm a, a certified earth therapist and also a registered psychotherapist. Um, and I'm one of the co-founders of Full Circle Art Therapy Center. Uh, we're a not-for-profit uh, social enterprise. And um, yeah, it was myself and Pearl Lee who uh, created Full Circle in 2014. Um, and our mission is to provide a safe place for people in need of mental health support uh, by helping them heal through creative means. So just before we get in the presentation today, I'm just gonna go over basically what you can expect in the outline. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what is our therapy, kind of just um, you know drawing the comparison of art therapy versus in our class. Um, talking a bit about the art therapy program at the Gatehouse. Also, um, how you know does art therapy, um, yeah, work in the treatment of trauma uh, and yeah, abuse. And then also we'll do an art therapy experiential, as Maria mentioned in the beginning. Um, and so for that, we'll just need um, at least probably three. Uh, sheets of paper because we're going to do a warm up activity, which will include one, and then we're going to do a main directive, which will take at least two sheets of paper. Um, and if you have any colored art materials, that is even better. <laughs> uh, but if not, even a pen or a pencil will work, and yeah, we'll make it work because we're creative, right? Um, and then at the end, if there's time, which I'm sure we will have time, um, we'll do a Q and A as well uh, via the Zoom chat. Uh, so I believe the format is, um, I think Maria will, will read some questions and then I'll just, just answer them just in case. Yeah, if, if there's a lot of answers, we'll just select a few or yeah, we'll see how it goes. So what is art therapy? So I have two definitions here. You can see one is from the Canadian Art Therapy Association. The other one's from the American Art Therapy Association. Um, I mean, they are quite similar, but you'll notice the difference as I read them. The first one with the Canadian Art Therapy Associations, uh, more focused with individual, um, an, art, an individual art therapy setting. Um, so we'll just look at that first. So art therapy combines the creative process and psychotherapy, facilitating uh, self-exploration and understanding, using imagery, color, and shape as part of the creative therapeutic process, whereas thoughts and feelings can be expressed that would otherwise be difficult to articulate. So it said it pretty clearly, it's just the combination of psychotherapy and visual arts um, and using the arts as a way of expanding communication passwords. Whereas the American Art Therapy Association is a more broader context, uh, which is why I also included it uh, in the definition here as well. Um, so they see art therapy as an integrative mental health and human services profession that enriches the lives of individuals, 
families and communities through active art making, creative process, applied psychological theory and human experience with a psychotherapeutic relationship. So it's very wordy, but essentially it's also just bridging the fact that it can serve families and communities as well, uh, which I've done you know, plenty of community work, which I'll, I'll speak to in terms of the art therapy program um, at the Gatehouse. I haven't really done much in terms of family art therapy work, but I can see how it'd be very beneficial considering a lot of the time with relational conflicts, it has to do with communication breakdown. Um, so yeah, the art can be a really good outlet of trying to give each person a safe space to communicate their perspective, right? And seeing that in another, um, yeah, perspective for each person. So what is the difference between art therapy and art class? Um, so yeah, there's actually quite a few differences. So one I would say is that uh, the most important actually is that to be in an art therapy session, you do not have to be an artist or have any artistic skill. Um, it's really about using the art as a way, again, of, of expanding that expression or your internal experience um, onto an external, external form. Um, whereas an art class is really focused on the technique, right? And building up that repertoire. So then you can build um, a certain aesthetic in your painting and your artwork. Um, so in an art therapy setting, we don't really teach techniques um, unless, you know, the client was just so afraid and judgmental to even use any art materials. So I might disintegrate a little bit of technique so they build comfort with the art so then they can continue to use it for self-expression. Um, another thing is that, um, yeah, art therapy is accessible to any age group. So there is this um, idea that it's mostly for children because it's art. Um, but actually anyone from ages three to like 90 or for however old you're, you can function and, you know, and use art, like we can work with any age and population. Um, and then the other thing that's really important is that art therapy focuses on the process more than the end product, uh, which again, in art class is very different because it's more focused on the end product, right, than the process itself. However, we would use the end product more um, as a way of observing the client's internal experience to see if there's another perspective or solutions that we could talk about together. Um, and then maybe even um, turning that into another art directive, right? Because the whole idea is about um, exploring the undermined and, and using the art as a connection in that way. Um, and then finally, another very important aspect is the therapeutic relationship with the client is very key. Um, like any uh, psychotherapy or therapy treatment, that's really the, the foundational point that you need to do any rich therapeutic healing and work with the client. Um, whereas in an art class, I don't think it really matters if you have a good personal relationship with your art teacher, as long as they're skilled and qualified to, to teach you um, art techniques. So, yeah, and I'll just talk briefly um, as well about the work that we're doing at the Gatehouse. Um, so essentially, yeah, the when this group began was in uh, spring 2015. <clears throat> So it's been a little bit over five years now since we've been doing work there. Um, and in the beginning, it was myself and Pearl Lee um, leading the programming there. Um, but now the dynamic's a little bit different. It's myself and uh, Zeta Jeffy, who's a peer um, support facilitator with the Gatehouse who's supervising the program. And then it's uh, predominantly led by two art therapy students. So one's from the Toronto Art Therapy Institute, uh, which is where I study. Um, and then the other one is at the Crate Institute, which is a little bit different because the focus is on expressive arts therapy. So it's not about only about the visual art making component um, with the therapy treatment. It also would integrate music, movement, play, drama therapy, and things like that. So it's actually really interesting to have both students there with different perspectives, right? Just in, in terms of their training. So I think that's really made the program develop a lot, like this new um, structure that we have in place. Um, yeah, and in terms of what we've delivered so far, so it's been, um, uh, I think, 17 groups so far is what I've counted um, and 84 people that were served. 
And we have two art therapy programs. Um, right now, the focus is, has been on phase one. So the requirements to get into phase one is basically anyone who's done the phase one uh, peer support talk group in the gatehouse is then okayed uh, to register for the phase one art therapy program. Um, and the phase one art therapy program really focuses on looking at the impacts of trauma, but again, looking at that um, in a more creative way, I guess. Um, and yeah, how that can be beneficial, again, is that sometimes it's really difficult to talk about those impacts verbally. Um, so the art gives another space to do that, maybe in a, a more safe or comforting way to people. Um, and then another um, thing that we focus on is really self-regulation tools as well, and just learning more about yourself. Um, so then it's easier to, to relate to other people, because that can be really difficult when you're not even sure what all the impacts are um, and cause with the trauma, it can also impact your relationships, right? So that awareness piece is very important uh, in not only healing your own trauma, but also in terms of uh, being able to relate to other people when you've experienced trauma. Um, and the other phase is a uh, phase two art therapy group, um, which we've done fewer groups, but um, what this uh, program focuses on is using um, altered books as a way of looking at your narrative. So that could include your trauma narrative, you know, basically uh, not only what happened, but all these other factors that come into play, right? Like secondary characters, so a lot of the time, uh, it also involves family dynamics or culture and all these other things that create a discourse around that experience. Um, <clears throat> but basically what we want to do is allow the trauma, or sorry, the survivor to yeah, be able to explore that story and being able to construct it in a way that's empowering to them, right? So it doesn't only have to be about what do they lose through that experience, maybe they'll also connect with what are some of the skills and strengths that they've learned through these experiences, important people that they've connected with. And then also, I think very importantly, looking at the other parts of their life, right? That maybe they um, have lost connection with through um, only focusing on the trauma narrative. So it can just really give space to look at the other parts of their story. Um, yeah, so then in terms of any upcoming groups, we're just finishing one now uh, with the phase one group. And then we'll have another one beginning, I believe sometime in February, but we'll be firming up the date. Um, so you can either check in with myself or where you're at the gatehouse, and then we can give you more information about that if you're interested in joining. Um, yeah, so now we'll go to the next turn. Oh, this is some artwork that's at the gatehouse. Um, so I'll just speak very briefly about it. So on the left-hand side, it was during the labyrinth opening. Um, we also did an art exhibit um, with um, different survivors at the gatehouse that um, told wasn't really about telling their story per se, but you know, or saying it in a, in a different way, right? Through the art in an empowering way in a group setting. So that's what the the right image is. There was a participant who, um, yeah, looked at her story of, um, yeah, being finding her voice. Basically, was what that that image was on the right, and then on the left was a group mural that we did. Um, yeah, as an interactive um, activity, activity for the community and people who were at the event. Uh, and it was very fun to make, so it's good memories. Uh, yeah, so in terms of art therapy and trauma, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways art therapy um, can benefit people who've experienced trauma. So I just have a few points here to focus on. Um, so yeah, the first one that I've already mentioned is definitely uh, the use of nonverbal communication through the artwork. Um, and why that is so important is because a lot of times people have experienced trauma or abuse. Um, there is a phenomenon that happens where uh, there's this feeling of loss of voice, um, possibly due from feelings of shame or guilt or other power structures that we're talking about, right? Like family dynamics is a very uh, important thing to consider, especially with childhood sexual abuse, because a lot of time the perpetrator may be a family member or someone that the victim already knows. Um, and so that can be another layer of shame and guilt and where that comes from, or another 
secondary trauma, they call it sometimes in, in, involved with that traumatic experience. Um, yeah, and using the art to create safety and autonomy can be really important too, because again, it's them having physical control over their story, right? Or, or not even their story, but just expressing their experiences um, with the trauma as well. So I find that is a really powerful piece too, because yeah, they can really go at their own pace, right? In terms of um, telling their story or the impacts of the trauma, or if they're feeling overwhelmed, like even if they want to discard the artwork that they're working on or put it away until next week when they feel ready to come back to. So there's a lot of flexibility there and control. Um, another term, another thing in terms of safety, a lot of the time too, um, especially like in the phase one um, art therapy group at the gatehouse, um, we'll focus on, uh, you know, either creating like a grounding box or, or doing like more um, grounding art directives in the beginning, just so it can create that safe uh, containment before kind of diving deeper into more, uh, yeah, again, like the impact traumas or things that could be dysregulating uh, to the client. Um, so that's also used as well in terms of art therapy and trauma work. Um, it's also very helpful in terms of the body-mind connection, because obviously, how can you do art without really, you know, physically feeling the art materials as you're using it. Like there's a lot of, um, yeah, like, you know, um, uh, formal thought in terms of planning and things like that. But again, like the art materials itself can be really grounding. So if you're feeling dissociated, sometimes, you know, just kind of pausing and kind of reconnecting with the art material and the physicality of it can be really valuable. Um, yeah, or, or sometimes I'll do work in terms of like, you know, looking at the body, if there's any tension, um, maybe through a body scan, and then we'll, uh, you know, take any points of tension, being able to look at it in the artwork. So really just building that uh, connection with the body, but again, in a safe way. Um, so going off of based off of um, what I noticed the, the comfort level is with that client uh, is how, how directly I would get them to engage with their body especially if they, you know, experience sexual abuse or something like that, where there's a violation um, of their boundary to their body. Um, another thing it can be helpful for is um, resurfacing memories or repressed emotions, um, which again, can be very common for people who've experienced trauma. It's not really uh, a matter of them you know, purposely not trying to remember those those feelings or emotions, right? A lot of the time it's just our body's way as a defense mechanism um, to kind of block out some of those memories or you may you hear survivors talking about just having clips of memories, right? That's a way of, um, yeah, the brain kind of shutting down because it's like, this is too much information. You can't handle this. Um, so yeah, after, you know, doing some, um, therapeutic work and if I felt the client was in a, a safe uh, stable place in terms of emotions and things like that then then maybe we would look at resurfacing memories or things like that if it would make them feel um, yeah I guess more whole in terms of their their trauma story but again I would always kind of look at where do they they um, seem to have control in terms of their emotions because um, it's you know, I heard this quote from my supervisor, which I love to always repeat. Uh, her name is Suzanne Thompson. Shout out to her. She's really great. Uh, but her, her quote for working with trauma survivors is slow is fast. Um, so there's a lot of techniques we could always work with people, but we really need to listen to where they're at because there's absolutely no point in re-traumatizing people through therapy because that's only going to deter them from continuing their, their healing journey, right? Which is always going to take, um, yeah, their own time and there is no definite time. And so just being respectful of that. Um, it can also be helpful for uh, decreasing symptoms of depression, anxiety, and PTSI. So post-traumatic stress injury. injury. Uh, so it's just a different uh, label. Sometimes it's used as uh, post-traumatic stress disorder which is more like, oh, that's something of a fault to yourself, whereas injury is, it was something inflicted on you. So that's the difference. 
Um, but in terms of how it could help with depression, um, I think one thing is definitely looking at those other parts of yourself that again, maybe the trauma has overshadowed. Um, so just being able to, again, engage in maybe more positive parts of yourself that can also um, eventually uh, increase your mood and, and self-stabilization is where I can see that being really helpful. In terms of anxiety and PTSI, um, you know, that's usually more feelings of um, feeling overwhelmed or overstimulation. Um, so where I see the art being really good for that, again, it was more about um, the relaxation elements. Um, so I would actually think about that in terms of what materials I may use or imagery or things like that, that, that would help them um, in terms of their self-soothing abilities. And again, being able to teach that to them so then they can use that outside a session and be able to use those skills for self-regulation. Um, yeah, and increasing self-esteem, sense of hope in the recovery process. So self-esteem, I think just really, again, getting to know those parts of themselves that maybe were overshadowed by the trauma, but then also, you know, being okay with those parts of themselves, they may have labeled as negative or difficult, right, in terms of the impacts of trauma um, will also help them in terms of increasing self-esteem. Um, and then also a sense of hope in the recovery process where I see that being probably most applicable in terms of the art therapy treatment would be actually the ability of documenting their progress. So you can actually go back later on and just kind of see, you know, this is where you were at the beginning when we met, this is at six months, let's say to a year, and then just really being able to see that, yeah, the progression that they've made through therapy. Um, and again, seeing that physically can be really empowering um, and just instill hope of, yeah, that, that, that more, um, you know, healing and recovery is possible, right? To, to a point where they feel uh, stable and, um, yeah, stable and happy in, in their own life and where they're at. So now we get to go to the fun part. So actually doing some art therapy together. Um, yeah. You see, maybe we can launch the poll as well, just to ask yeah, people yeah, what sure. their experience is with art therapy, but just before yeah. we go, there's a, mm -hmm. a quick poll, everyone, um, just to give us an idea of what your experience is with art therapy. If you could just um, click on a response that fits with um, your experience, that would be helpful. Beautiful. Wow, a lot of the people that are here today okay. do not have any experience with art therapy. Great. Okay. Very good. Cool. Beautiful. And we have a couple of people who are <laughs> therapists in the room as well. Nice. Beautiful. All, All right. right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Share the results on screen so everyone can see. Um, do you see the results on your screen, uh, Lacey? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, most this will be your first time and that's, that's good. Okay. Let's, yeah, let's uh, get started then. So as I was mentioning, um, what I would like to do in terms of our, our today is starting off with a warm-up uh, directive and then we'll do a main directive. So what that means in, in art therapy lingo uh, is a warm-up directive is what you would do is basically for a way of people getting into the art space and just getting their head aligned, right, to focus on uh, the art therapy process. Um, so you may do that in many different ways. Um, I like to integrate mindfulness practice into my warm up exercises because not only does it uh, reorient you to the art, but it also reorients you to the space and, and just being in a more grounded state before um, doing the therapy work in the session. Um, so what I thought we could do today is actually a common uh, warm up exercise that integrates mindfulness and it is either called drawing the breath or painting the breath. Um, and essentially what that is, I'm just going to move to the next slide. <clears throat> Oops. Oh. Okay, whatever, it'll be on the next one, but I'll say that in a minute. Uh, so essentially what that process is, looks like is I'm just going to get us through a mindful stance, meaning uh, connecting with the space, connecting with our breath, just in a seated meditation. And then we're going to turn our attention to a piece of paper that we have in front of us and an art material that will represent your breath. And it can be any color that you choose to represent your breath if you have color to choose from. Or if you don't, that's okay too. It may it just be focusing on the movement, which is okay. 
So it may look like pretty unstructured, you know, if it's just simply, oops. I don't know if you can see that. If it's just following the breath, maybe like, you know, the inhalation, exhalation, maybe it looks like a pattern of going up and down or whatever that looks like. Or you can do it in a more structured way. So, you know, as you're doing your inhale, you're just getting your art material ready on the paper. And then when you exhale, you're going to draw a line just for as long as you're exhaling. And then you're just going to keep doing that all the way down to your paper for, uh, for about two minutes. I'm going to allow us to do this or guide us to do this. And then that's basically all we're going to do for the warm up. But basically, it's just about connecting with your breath, not about creating a specific image. Okay, so I'm going to guide us through that in a second. But just things to keep in mind as we're doing the art therapy exercises. Um, remembering there's no artistic uh, techniques or skills needed. So therefore, you do not need to judge the artwork that you're creating. Again, we focus on the process rather than the end product. So again, just being gentle with yourself through expressing yourself through the art and trying not to have a pre-existing idea of what your art needs to look like. So all these points are about self-judgment and just trying to keep that at bay and just trying to have fun with the process and this learning experience. Okay, so now let's do the warm-up exercise. <clears throat> So we're just going to begin first um, just by getting in a comfortable seated position. <clears throat> and if you need to adjust your posture in any way, you can do that as well. So you're not restricting your breath. And then we're just going to begin by finding where the soles of your feet are connecting with the floor. And then just noticing where your body is connected with your chair or whatever is supporting you in that space. And then just becoming aware of any sounds in the space that may be calling your awareness at this time. And then you can just gently move your awareness inward to meet the natural rhythm of your breath. And as always, just greeting this breath with a gentle curiosity and without needing to judge it or change it in any way. You're just simply noticing the depth of each inhalation as you breathe in. and the length of each exhalation as you breathe out. I'm just doing this for a moment until you feel connected with your natural breath. Then whenever you feel focused on your breath, you're just going to turn your attention to the paper in front of you and the art material you've selected to represent your breath. And just for the next two minutes, you're just going to simply continue to follow your natural breath and just extend this onto the paper. And just remember, it could either look unstructured, just following it how it looks, or if you want more structure, again, just having your art material ready on your paper for your inhalation, and on the exhalation, breathing out, and drawing a line for as long as you're breathing out. Also just try to remember that the intention is just staying with your breath, not about changing it in any way or 
are creating a complete art room. And if your attention wanders at any time, just take a moment to pause, just to pay attention with whatever took your attention away. And then just gently try to bring your attention back to your breath, and back to the art material in your hand. Again, just following your breath onto the paper with your art material. Do this just for one more. begin to pause or come to a stop. And then if you would like, you can just take a moment to be witness of your, your breath drying and yeah, just either notice if it perhaps represents how you're feeling at this moment or, or just noticing how it, how it feels to sit with this, this um, image that represents your breath. Thank you, everyone. So now we're going to go to the main directive. So I have that in quotations just to explain what is the main directive. Um, so basically what that lingo means is, um, yeah, it would be a, a focal art exercise that you would use for a specific intention and reason, depending on the treatment uh, that you're working or the treatment goals that you're working with your client. So today I chose an art directive um, about self-regulation, just because we're talking about art therapy and trauma and self-regulation is a very important part of that work. Um, so where I got this art directive actually is from a book um, by um, other art therapists. Uh, I have it in my, my references in the slides. So maybe I'll send these even to Maria later and she can send them to everyone. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, this, this book is really good. So it's in the references. It's called Paper Dolls and Paper Airplanes, uh, th Therapeutic Exercises for Sexually Traumatized Children. So it has many different exercises. Uh, but essentially the one that I'm going to do from there, um, it's called a balloon, um, balloon directive. So basically what we're going to do, and I'm just gonna be creative, draw my envelope here. So <laughs> we're gonna have two, uh, artwork. So basically the first thing you need to do on, on one piece of paper and take up the whole paper. I'm just using half of it because I'm going to draw another balloon on the other side to represent the second uh, piece later. But first you're just going to draw a balloon outline to cover as much as you possibly can on the sheet of paper that you have in front of you. Okay, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Lacey? Would be yeah. helpful if you stop sharing the, the screen so that you can. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. So it's bigger. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to stop that. Okay, so yeah, so for the first piece of paper, I'm just going to draw a balloon outline. Doesn't have to look perfect. And uh, basically, what you're going to do inside of this balloon outline 
is you're just going to use color, shape, line, just thinking abstractly um, to represent the different feelings that you're experiencing currently. And you may want to think of the colors to have a specific, again, specific color code or pattern, whatever that looks like. Thinking about the size of space they're taking in your experience, which is the balloon, or maybe even the placement, right, of those emotions and in the relationship together. Those are things you can think about. Um, but just because of time, we're just going to do this maybe for two to three minutes, um, just so then we can, you know, get an idea of what that looks like. So don't get too caught up on what it looks like, but just trying out the, the exercise. And then the second image I'll explain after, but essentially it's going to be another balloon outline, uh, but just different uh, intention of what you're creating inside of it. Lacey, if you could just remind everyone what they are creating inside the balloon. Oh, yeah, sorry. So inside the balloon is basically just going to be representing your emotional state currently. So I did one very quickly um, of lines as some feelings of calm, some headiness that happens when I present. I get in my head a little bit, so it's little swirlies on the top and a little bit of nerves in my belly. So I had little dots on the bottom. and just using color and shape, so nothing extravagant. And you know, also if you find like two or three minutes isn't enough time for you personally, what I would do is actually just write out the instructions and do it after the presentation because there's no sense of trying to rush through it and, and feeling anxious, right? So if that feels better to you, that's okay. Let's take one more minute to finish this up and I'll explain the second balloon here in a minute. Okay, so just finish up whatever you have ready. Again, it's okay if you, if you want to add something later, you can go ahead and do that if you feel like it's unfinished in any way. Um, and the second art piece now, we're just going to create again another, oops, another balloon outline there. So it's going to be, yeah, again, try to take up as much space as you can. So there's plenty of room to fill in later. This balloon, again, is going to focus on feelings, but it's going to be how you would like to feel right now. So not how you are feeling, how you want to feel right now. And so that may be look completely different than your first balloon. If you don't wanna feel anything you feel actually currently right now, or maybe it's the same emotions, but just different placement and shape. It's up to you. Uh, but again, the second balloon is how you would like to feel. And 
again, we'll have around two minutes because we're already getting close to the time. Lisa, I just had a question from Kira. Um, yes. Can you repeat what abstract things were drawings? Was it feelings? Yeah, so it is feelings inside of this balloon as well. But the difference is in the first balloon, it was how you are feeling right now. And the second balloon is how you would like to feel right now. So just take one more minute to finish the second balloon. And then I'm just gonna explain basically how you may want to work with these two images afterwards verbally. We won't have enough time to actually do it. Um, just so there is maybe a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. Okay. Basically, when you are finished, these are some things I would consider looking at. <clears throat> so one, obviously, you may want to look at what are the, you know, uh, maybe similarities or differences in the balloons, right? Like, is it much of a shift that you would need to do in your emotions to go from state one to two? Um, that's something to consider. Um, and then also, Another thing I would do is thinking about how do you get from balloon one to two? And then thinking maybe about each emotion, right? So if let's say uh, I had some uh, nervousness, right? In my first balloon. So how would I go from balloon one of feeling it here to being in a more flowing state? So I just integrated that more with my flow, like just accepting that it's okay to be there and that it doesn't feel so heavy basically. So acceptance was one thing that I shifted the emotion of nervousness in balloon one to balloon two. So it's not heavy at the bottom here, it's flowing. So you may wanna think about that for each emotion. So for, yeah, uh, let's say sadness was one, what would I do to you know shift my sadness from balloon one to two where it's not there at all, or it's very small then, right? Like there's different skills you may already have in your toolbox that you can refer back to or if you don't think you have them, maybe just thinking of past experiences, what was helpful in those moments of feeling sad before to make you feel a bit better. So yeah, that's basically a self-regulation tool. So it's because it's acknowledging where are you, but also where would you like to be and how do you yeah, shift from one mood state to the other, basically. Okay, so. I'm going to stop talking for a moment and see if you guys have any questions or if all of you have any questions. <laughs> Feel free to type in any questions or comments that you have into the chat and I'll, I'm more than happy to read them aloud for everyone. And thank you so much, Lacey, for uh, doing this for us. I can show you my balloons are mm -hmm. uh, special. <laughs> <laughs> no judgment, they're perfect. <laughs> And this is the second one, I was like, I know what I need because I want to get more energized. So mine was, um, I need to eat uh, regularly, and today has been a challenge for me to do that. So yeah, definitely. Oh, here we go. Here's a question. Uh, Wendy is asking if you offer out of province Zoom sessions. Yeah, yeah, that's been, I guess, one benefit of this recent climate. I guess that you call that a benefit. Um, yeah, because we are doing uh, sessions online right now, so that opens us up to 
serving anywhere in the world really that has Zoom. Um, yeah, so we are, and if you're interested in looking at the art therapist at Full Circle, just go to our website. Um, maybe I'll write it in the chat. It's uh, fullcircleatc.com. And you would just click on art therapists, or no, sorry, therapist profiles. Uh, and then you can select a therapist that you like, and then it has their contact info there. Another uh, question, Lacey, how can this strategy be used with children? Are there any additional questions you would ask? I think you could definitely use this with children. The difference would be the language you would use with them. Um, and also with children or with actually even pe adults sometimes who have uh, lower emotional intelligence in terms of labeling their emotions. Uh, sometimes I'll use like, you know, just a similar, a si uh, sorry, a simple feelings chart where it has facial expressions because they may not have the language yet, but they would know, you know, through their own experience or other people's mirroring of emotions, what, what they may look like more so. Um, so you may want to relate to, yeah, feelings chart to be able to look in the face or maybe asking them, you know, is there any body sensations you're feeling now that you may want to change, you know? So again, changing the language depending on their level of awareness in terms of talking about emotions is one difference I would do. Um, yeah, so I actually, I think those are the, the main things I would do is uh, talking about language um, and then I'm sure, you know, knowing the child beforehand too, like knowing their, their, um, their ability of, of self-reflection would be important to know. So maybe you can alter it, you know, and again, more simple language, depending on where they're at. Any other questions or comments? If you want to just write them into the chat, I'm just going to click on Q and A. Um, Oh, uh, I had a question. What does the container of the balloon symbolize? Oh, the container of the balloon would symbolize um, the person. So a lot of the time when people are expressing emotions or experiences, uh, you may want to use a balloon as a container, or really there can be many different things that you could symbolically use as a container. Maybe the client even has a symbol they would like to work with that makes them feel at ease, right, in terms of containment. But the whole idea is to contain the emotion so they don't feel overwhelming when they're on the paper. That's the main purpose of it. Beautiful. I mean, again, with children, it might look different. Like I've done body outlines signifying where do they feel feelings. Maybe that would make more sense to them because uh, then it's, again, using the whole body. Beautiful. Um, one more. What are some examples of exercises of other art forms that can be used? Okay, well, that's very broad. I would suggest, because there's seriously like so, so many different ways you can use the art. If you're looking for more instructional art therapy books, um, I would search online, uh, but definitely looking for ones that are written by art therapists uh, is definitely something I'd look at. So looking at their titles, like isn't an art therapist or even you know, a psychologist or someone with that, that background and not just someone claiming it's an art therapy book, like coloring books, which, you know, an art therapist didn't make the coloring book. That was just any artist could do that. So looking, yeah, just at their credentials, but um, yeah, definitely that one I had mentioned, uh, the paper dolls one. I, I posted uh, the, the link to the Amazon uh, purchase mm -hmm. if anyone was interested in the chat. The other thing that you do too that's really interesting um, is sometimes you work with um, clay you work yeah. with, uh, um, yeah. concrete even you guys have done some really cool and different things uh or different ways of processing so not just with crayons yeah. and paper you, you've done that and i love seeing that because it's, again it's that tactile they're yeah. um, using the clay to, to form um their story can you say just a little bit about that activity like what yeah. how was it done and what was its purpose yeah so um yeah, we've used clay for, for different ways, but the reason why I would use clay, like that's another thing to think about. Um, that's why like the art therapy directives themselves can be helpful that anyone can use. Uh, but in terms of using different art materials, that's something that 
yeah, you kind of learn more as either being an artist or the training, but like just thinking of what could be most helpful depending on what you're working with. So with the clay, a lot of the time it would be useful in terms of um, grounding and self-soothing, self-regulation, because one, the temperature of the clay is very cool in the beginning and it changes as you're working with it. So you're very connected in terms of temperature, the, the texture changes as you're, as you're using it, like it's actually more moist and smooth before you use it because you're actually taking moisture out of the clay and the clay is taking moisture out of you. It's a very intimate exchange. Um, and also it's very malleable and flexible. So it can be really helpful in working with difficult emotions because you can change it very easily and frequently. Um, yeah, I love clay, but yeah. So yeah, that's why I would use clay. But then some people I notice if I work with them, they hate mess and things like that. So I probably wouldn't use clay with them knowing them personally. So that's, that can be the difference and benefit of working with someone uh, in an individual setting versus group. Group, I just kind of have to hope people will be okay with using clay. And if not, I'll have something like in the bathroom that I can use, right? Like um, to adjust that, like maybe plasticine because it doesn't have the same stickiness or um, uh, messy quality to it. Cause some people can find clay actually the opposite and find it regressive. Um, and brings out their inner child where it's not soothing uh, if they've had trauma as a child. So then if I notice that they're being dysregulated or it wasn't being a soothing experience, then I'd probably suggest for them to try a different art medium. Yeah, thank you so much, Lacey. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, you will have a survey at the end of this. So once we sign off today, um, there'll be a brief survey. If you can let us know how your experience was, it's totally anonymous, that would be great. Thank you again, Lacey, for spending time with us. These videos yeah. will be available on our social media channels in the next few minutes. Thanks, everyone. Have a safe, wonderful day. And we'll see you at some point in the near future, Lacey. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, Bye.